Uh, hi, I'm Skinny Cheeks. I was super stoked to find out this year I was invited to get an early preview of the upcoming High Isle chapter. This was on a pre-PTS server that was set up so we could get a sneak peek at what Zoss is working on. Today, I'm super excited to share with you some of the goodies that I found when playtesting. Now, I wasn't allowed to do any video capture or screen grabs or anything like that, so everything you see will be either footage they provided me to use or scenes from the live server, and then I made my own custom graphics to show off the different things that we'll talk about. I was a little disappointed pointed to hear that we shouldn't focus too much on the combat and balance stuff in the update as my channel is mostly focused around combat and balance in ESO but I totally understand where they're coming from the build that we got to take a look at was over a month old from where they are currently at and will be even further behind what we see when the PTS launches so a lot of the stuff I saw might not even make it onto the PTS much less the actual live server in June with the release think of this more as a sneak peek into the minds of the devs as they work through the update with a chance to be a fly on the wall midway through their production. So I ask, please don't take anything here related to combat and balance too seriously, and please don't go and make forum posts complaining about changes that haven't even come yet. If something is there that you don't like once the PTS patch notes come out, absolutely give feedback then, but that isn't what this is for right now. This is a unique opportunity I had to see what they were working on, and I thought it was really cool to get to dig through something that was still a work in progress and that they are still iterating on. So in this video, we'll cover some new quality of life features coming with High Isle, my impressions of the new trial, Dreadsail Reef, and the new item sets, which include craftable, overland, trial, and mythic sets. And then we'll just go through some random stuff I stumbled upon when digging through the preview server, including some new champion point slottable notes. One last thing before we start, I just wanted to say thank you so much to those who have subscribed to the channel. We just hit 40k subs, and I will be giving away 50,000 crowns in ESO as a thank you when we do finally hit that 50k mark. So if you aren't subbed and want to help us get there a little quicker, that would be amazing. Subbing on YouTube is free, and you can always change your mind later if you're no longer interested in the content. With that all out of the way, let's go ahead and get started. So let's start off with some new quality of life features that will be coming with High Isle. The first is one of my favorites, which is the new quick slot wheel. So previously we just had one wheel that was pretty limited in space with what you could put on it. I typically would have some potions, food, assistance, and maybe a cosmetic or a memento slotted if I could squeeze one in. Well, now they're going to be extending that to five different quick slot wheels. They were labeled quick slot, emotes, mementos, allies, and tools. So the wheel picture here is just from the live server as I wasn't able to do screen grabs, but essentially how it works is that you can now quickly cycle through the five different quick slot menus. On PC, this was by default left clicking or right clicking to go forwards or backwards while you're holding the quick slot button. So instead of having eight slots, you now have 40. It's going to be really nice to squeeze some more commonly used stuff onto that quick slot wheel and not have to narrow it down to only eight items. So not a massive change, but definitely a welcome one. And I'm pretty stoked to load up with some of my favorite mementos to be able to easily use on demand without the need for key binding them with add-ons. The next quality of life thing coming is they are adding Mundus Stones to the Armory. They had previously commented publicly that this was intended to eventually come to the Armory, but they were having some issues with setting it up. Reading through the forums and Discord posts, a lot of the player base had speculated this was because of the Mundus Stones being for sale in housing, and they didn't want to hurt their sales there, but it looks like they were just having trouble getting it to work with the new Armory system, and they have resolved that. Pretty nice change, just one less step you need to take when changing to a different build in the Armory. Next thing up is they have also redesigned the in-game leaderboards. So the premise is still the same, but if any of you have been around for a while or tried looking through the leaderboards in the past, you'll know that they can be pretty buggy and sometimes omit names from the list or just overall be pretty inconsistent with the results that they show. So now they should always show the individuals that are on the leaderboard and there's going to be a new tab now for the Tales of Tribute card game. So let's talk about the new trial now. I was able to run Dreadsail Reef a couple of times on the preview server on normal difficulty. I wish I could show some footage of us actually running it, but we'll have to wait for the PTS to drop to see it. I was pretty impressed with the design from an aesthetic point of view. You have your typical three main bosses that have optional hard mode banners with trash waves in between, but each area is very distinct from the previous and it feels like you're really covering a lot of ground working through it. It seems like a really large instance with lots of different sections. There were also a couple of side bosses that we came across as well. I'm not sure if there are any others that we may have missed, but definitely at least two side bosses. Can't really speak to the overall difficulty as we only went through it on normal, but there were definitely some mechanics that needed to be followed with 
the main bosses. Otherwise, there were group wipes. So I imagine on veteran, it's going to be pretty punishing. There were also some pretty funny new mechanics on the trash mobs as well, but I'm not going to spoil that. I'll leave that for you guys to experience on the test server. But overall, I did get a really positive impression from the trial, and I have high hopes for it on veteran difficulties. All right, now let's get into the new sets. Please remember, as I mentioned in the beginning of this video, all sets shown are a work in progress and may or may not make it into the game in their current form. These also might not even make it into the game at all. This is 100% just for fun to see what Zoss was coming up with early in the development of this High Isle chapter. So we were just talking about the trial, so let's go ahead and go through the trial sets. As usual, there are four that drop in both perfected and non-perfected, depending on the difficulty that you do the trial on. First up, we have the heavy armor set. Bear with my graphics here that I put together. Like I said, I wasn't allowed to do any screen grabs, so I just made my own versions of the normal set tooltips. This one is called Pearlescent Ward. It gives max health, minor aegis, healing taken, more max health if it's perfected, and then for the five piece bonus, increases your weapon and spell damage by 180 for you and up to 11 other group members based on the number of group members that are alive. Increases your damage resistance from non-player enemies by up to 66% for you and up to 11 other group members based on the number of group members that are dead. You can only benefit from this set from one source. So this is a pretty interesting concept, I think. When I first read it, I assumed that 180 weapon and spell damage meant 180 per group member, which would be absolutely ridiculous, but I think it's just 180 regardless of the number of group members. And then it decreases by a percent amount based on total group members. So if you had only four group members and one was dead, it would be three fourths of the 180 until the person was resurrected. Or if you had 12 group members, it would be 11 twelfths of the amount until that person was resurrected. At least I think that's how it's going to work. I did really get a chance to mess with it, but that seems the logical way for it to operate. And then the next part of that five piece bonus would work in the opposite manner. So the more teammates that are dead, the more damage resistance you build up. Not anything too crazy as far as buffing the damage of the group. It is a little lower than something you'd get from a set like Yolnikrin, which is minor courage and gives 250 weapon and spell damage, but it's not much lower than that and could be pretty nice for progging through content as it could really help to avoid wipes as everyone would be tankier as teammates start dying and allow for easier recoveries. We'll see where the numbers on this set end up. Again, this is an early version of it, but I think the design idea is really cool overall. The next set is a light support set. This one is called Pillager's Prophet. We get Healing Done, Minor Aegis, Max Magicka, and then some Magicka Recovery if you have it in Perfected. And then for the five piece bonus, casting an ultimate while in combat grants 28% of the cost as ultimate to up to 11 group members within 12 meters. Group members can only be affected by this set every 25 seconds. So first impressions, this seems really good. It does say cost though, not ultimate spent. So I'm not 100% sure how that's gonna work with building past the original ultimate cost. It seems like using Warhorn as an example, that costs 250 ultimate. So casting it would give everyone 70 ultimate regardless of how much ult the wearer saved up. But not 100% sure on the specifics of that. We'll have to wait and see once it hits the PTS. But that's how it reads to me anyways. It does also say you can only benefit from this set once every 25 seconds. So you couldn't have multiple people in this allowing for endless back to back to back ultimate gain. It would also take some coordination to make sure the wearer is not casting their ult right before other people use their ultimates, but seems like another really cool idea for a set. I like this one and the tank one a lot from a design standpoint. Again, we will see where the numbers end up. The 28% value in the 25 seconds could be changed up by the time this actually hits the PTS, but definitely seems like it has a lot of promise so far. The next set we'll go through is the Light Armor Damage Dealer set. This one is called Whirl of the Depths. It gives weapon and spell damage, minor slayer, weapon and spell damage, and crit chance if you have the perfected version. For the five piece bonus, when you deal damage with the light attack, you apply Whirl of Depths to the target, dealing X frost damage over eight seconds. When this effect ends, five meter whirlpool is created under the target for six seconds and deals X frost damage every one second. This effect can occur once every 18 seconds and scales off the higher of your weapon and spell damage. So quite a few things to break down with this one. I did leave the tool tips off. Not only is it possible they aren't finalized, but they scale dynamically with your current stats. So it would be hard to make sense of just some random tool tips here. But for a comparison here, it did seem like the DPS of this set over 18 seconds was roughly 85 or so percent of what Pillar of Nern would give you over 10 seconds. So a good bit higher than Pillar of Nern for damage, but with a longer cooldown. But don't read too much into that with it being an early build. 
So how it works is that when you light attack, you apply that initial eight second single target dot to the target that you light attacked. So it's very controllable that way with who you want to apply it to. And then after that eight second period, the AOE Whirlpool goes underneath them and damages anything that it touches for six seconds. The damage on this set is very heavily backloaded in this AOE section. So the initial eight seconds seems to only do about like 15% or so of the total damage from the set. And then the rest of that 85% or so of the damage from the set is crammed into that final six seconds from the AOE on the ground. So it could end up a big waste if the boss moves after the whirlpool goes down. Again, I don't want to read too much into the numbers, but overall, I got a pretty good impression from this set. It seems like one of those that could be really nice for fights that need some cleave damage and have closely stacked adds in them. And it's very easy to keep up as it just procs from a light attack and there's no stacks to maintain or to keep up with. Really, the only big concern will be if targets are moving out of the AOE. Other than that, it seems pretty promising as a new light armor set. Then the final set from the new trial is Coral Riptide. This one is a medium armor damage dealer set. It adds crit chance, minor slayer, penetration, and then more penetration on the perfected bonus. Then for the five piece, increases your weapon and spell damage by up to 740 based on your missing stamina. So this is very similar to Besides Mania, except instead of a percent increase, it increases your weapon and spell damage, and it appears that it does not have that non-player target limitation that Besai has. I don't want to read too much into the 740 there, as it could easily change before we see it on the PTS, but overall, I'm not sure I love the direction of this one. Stamina is definitely a lot more risky to run low than your Magicka is, but I feel like I'd much rather have a percent boost from Besai than a weapon and spell damage boost. Of course, that could always change depending on what that weapon and spell damage boost ends up at, but we just have so many sources of it already through group buffs. We're typically already pushing seven to eight K weapon and spell damage in organized trial compositions. One thing this does have going for it versus some other high weapon and spell damage sets is that you can get that amount instantly. So maybe for some AOE trash encounters, you could dump your stamina beforehand and be sitting on quite a bit of extra weapon and spell damage to open it up. But we'll see how it plays out and where this one ends up. I don't want to make too much of it at the moment. We'll definitely dig in and give feedback once the PTS opens up though. All right, now let's go through the Overland sets. As usual with the Overland stuff, these are not quite as spicy as the Trial sets or the Mythics, but still some interesting stuff here. The heavy set is called Sistrasis Scowl. This gives stamina, health, stamina, and the five piece is when you bash an enemy, place Sistrasis Scowl on them for 15 seconds. When hit by a light attack, a target with Sistrasis Scowl takes X frost damage up to once every second. I didn't get a chance to test this one out, but it looks like it doesn't just work off of your light attacks, but your teammates light attacks as well. The tooltip on it was only around 2k or so, so nothing too crazy, but I don't want to focus on that part too much for now. I also notice that it doesn't mention anything about scaling with your stats, so it might be just a static number that doesn't change, but I'm not 100% sure. Pretty easy condition to keep up though, just requires a bash once every 15 seconds, but we'll go ahead and move on to the next one. The medium set is called Steadfast Metal. This adds stamina recovery, max stamina, max stamina, and then the five pieces when you have a food buff active, reduce the cost of your core combat abilities by 25%. To me, this one is kind of meh. Honestly, it could say 50% there, and I don't think I'd probably use it. It just doesn't really fit into my kind of playstyles. but maybe for someone else out there wanting to roll around a lot or block like a madman, this could be an interesting option. And then finally for the Light Armor Overland set, this one is called Blessing of High Isle. This gives Max Magicka, Magicka Recovery, Max Magicka, and then the five piece bonus is when you are healed while in combat, increase your weapon and spell damage by 369 for five seconds. So nothing too crazy here, super easy condition to keep up, not really anything too appealing over some other options that we have already though. But we'll see where this all ends up. Again, as a reminder, please don't go in the forums or make any complaints on any of this stuff. This is all pre-PTS and sub to change. All right, now we'll do the crafted sets and then we'll end this section with the mythic items after that. So the first one is called Serpent's Disdain. This adds max stamina, max health, max magicka, and then increases the duration of status effects you apply by 16 seconds. I think this one's pretty interesting, but typically status effects are controllable enough to reapply at least close to their four second durations without needing to extend them out this far. This could make for some really easily kept up status effects though, if you are wanting to play in a bit more casual and stress-free kind of way. I could see this being a nice early tanking option, especially since it's crafted where you could easily keep up a lot of status effects with very minimal effort needed. This does come into play a little bit with one of the new champion point nodes that I'll talk about in a bit as well. But for end game type stuff, I don't think we'll probably have room to be squeezing this one in. 
The next crafted set is Order's Wrath. This one is crit chance, weapon and spell damage, crit chance, and then more crit chance on the five piece along with 8% increase to critical damage and healing. This is very similar to Medusa except that it's craftable so it can be made in any weight. And instead of the named minor force buff for 10% crit damage, it gives a unique 8% crit damage buff on the five piece. This seems really nice for a craftable set. If nothing is tweaked with it, probably the new go-to craftable set for DPS. It'll be versatile as well since you can make it in light or medium, and the bonuses are just really solid all around for damage. So I'll definitely be keeping an eye on this one as we move forward into the PTS. And then the last crafted set is a doozy. This one is called Druid's Braid. This is the first set we've seen that extends out to 12 pieces. It just rotates through the three main resource stats, giving health, magicka, and stamina. So very similar to Trainee, though the values on the stats are slightly different than Trainee, but I don't know if that's how it's going to end up or if that's a a placeholder so we'll have to see once that actually hits the pts i'm not sure i see the point in going past four pieces here maybe i'm overlooking something definitely a nice craftable way to fill in some gaps in your build but if you had room for a five piece set or more i'm not really sure why you'd use this to fill in the slots maybe just something for fun but i definitely see this being useful in smaller amounts all right, now let's go through the mythic items. There are some pretty juicy ones here. First one we'll go through is called Dovra Sabatons. These are heavy and go on your footsies. While sprinting, gain a stack of draconic speed every 0.5 seconds, granting you 660 armor up to 20 stacks max. Upon stopping, you deal X physical damage per stack in an 8 meter shockwave and retain draconic speed for 10 seconds, but cannot gain new stacks. At 20 stacks, this damage will also stun for 3 seconds. The damage from this ability scales off the higher of your physical or spell resistance. So I didn't really get to mess with this much. I did run around inside of one of the houses a little bit with it on just to see what it looked like, but the damage on it didn't seem to scale up too high with reaching about 33k resistances, but it's possible I was looking at that wrong. I'm not 100% sure on that. And the armor does scale up pretty high after running for 10 seconds though, and does last for another 10 seconds after you release that sprint. So maybe like running up to a pack of enemies and dropping an ult on them, and that could be timed with the burst from this set, and then you'd be really tanky for another 10 seconds to finish them off as well. This probably won't be one I'll be farming out right when this comes out, but I bet it'll be cool for some niche setups out there. The next mythic is Left Hander's War Girdle. This one causes dodge roll to no longer evade attacks and instead grants a damage shield that absorbs up to 20k damage over one second. This damage shield is unaffected by battle spirit. So pretty massive shield, but you can no longer dodge the damage from attacks. The shield also only lasts for one second, so you will need to time it properly with whatever hit you're trying to mitigate. It's a pretty big shield though, and it could be nice to make use of roll dodge against attack types that can't be dodged. I tested it and it does also scale up with the Bastion CP node, which increases your shields by 15%, so almost a 25k shield if you have that slotted. Seems like this could be pretty useful on certain setups. All right, this next mythic is Mora's Whispers. These are light shoulders. So you gain up to 1528 crit chance and 10% increased inspiration, alliance rank, alliance skill, and monster kill experience based off how many books of Shalador's library have been collected. So according to UESP, Shalador's library has a total of 297 books, so get ready to do some farming. This is pretty nice though. 1528 crit chance is what you get from a five piece bonus on Mother's Sorrow, which is close to 7%. So really nice for a one piece set. Of course, that could always be changed. We don't want to read too much into that specific number for now, but a little more crit chance than the kilt with no extra crit damage. I think the kilt would be a bit stronger on fights where it's usable, but this seems like a great set it and forget it kind of set. One drawback is that it is a shoulder slot, so you will be unable to do a two piece monster set with it if you are running a less traditional style of build that would allow for both a mythic and a monster set. But really nice overall for both damage and the secondary perks of increased XP gain. I do see this being one of the more popular ones if it stays in its current form. All right, for the next one up, this one's pretty crazy. This is the Oaken Soul Ring. It adds 300 weapon and spell damage, 3816 armor, health recovery, magicka recovery, stamina recovery, health, magicka, and stamina. So pretty great, huh? All that with no drawbacks. 
All right, sorry I baited you guys a bit. There is one final stipulation on it, and it is while equipped, you are unable to swap between your primary and backup weapon sets. So this seems like it is going to be the ultimate mythic for those that enjoy doing one bar builds. It won't be enough to close the gap from utilizing a back bar, but it has a ton of great perks that will be really beneficial for those that only want to play one bar builds anyways. Personally, I think this is a really cool addition to the game. It's great for accessibility, but not so overpowered that people would feel forced into choosing using one bar builds over two bar builds if they don't want to. And then the final mythic that I saw on the preview server is called Sea Serpent's Coil. This had a ring icon, but went in the necklace slot. So I'm gonna assume it's supposed to be a necklace and just had a placeholder icon on it. The bonus is while at full health, you gain 40% damage resistance. After taking damage while at full health in combat, you gain Serpent's Rebuke for 10 seconds, snaring yourself by 40% and gaining Major Berserk and Major Courage, increasing your damage done by 10% and weapon and spell damage by 430. The damage resistance does not apply while Serpent's Rebuke is active. So this one seems really interesting to me. Probably this one in Mora's Whispers would be my favorite too. And with this one, especially for solo play where you'll be consistently taking damage to keep this up. And also for group play for encounters where there is consistent incoming damage to proc it as well. The Major Courage will often be redundant for group play, but who knows, maybe on a fight where it can be kept up really well, this could free up another gear slot for a support in the group to run. But the Major Berserk will be a really nice boon as well and allow you to run something besides Kenra's Wrath and still get that sweet 10% damage bonus. The 40% Snare will probably be pretty annoying for some stuff, but for more stationary encounters, or if you have some nice speed buffs already built into your kit to offset said it, it really isn't the worst trade-off for how much offensive power you get in return. You do have to be taking damage though, and some encounters you simply aren't taking damage often as a DPS. That 40% damage resistance against the opening hit that you take is pretty cool too. I did test this a little, and you cannot continue to proc the buffs before the cooldowns are up, so you do have to wait the full 10 seconds for their durations to expire and then take damage at full health again to trigger them again. So that is kind of why I was thinking you probably need to be taking some pretty consistent Consistent damage in order to keep this up well. Or if there is a nearby constant damage zone, like under the dragons in Sunspire, for example, you could dip in and out every time the timer runs off to re-trigger it again. So really strong looking set though, and I definitely see this one being used on a lot of encounters if it stays the way it is. And then especially for solo use, since it gives both Major Courage and Major Berserk. I feel like it's a really nice alternative to the kilt too, as you want to be hit when you wear this one rather than wanting to avoid taking hits with the kilt. So nice flexibility for both kinds of scenarios. All right, those are the new sets. I know I've said it a lot, but please don't overreact to the specifics of them. Wait for the PTS and who knows, maybe there will be a lot of changes and then we can give feedback and go cry on the forums. That's fine. This was just for fun to see what the devs were thinking up about a month or so ago. I'll definitely do another deep dive into all this once the PTS hits and we're getting a little closer to a live release. Overall, I'm pretty impressed though. I think a lot of these will be getting used and there are some really creative ideas here. For the last section of this video, I just wanted to go through a few random things I stumbled across when playing around on the preview server. So first up, I did notice some new champion point nodes. These are in the warfare section under the extended might subsection. The first one is the return of the exploiter node. This gives a 10% damage boost to targets that are off balance. So we may start seeing lightning staves on support again to trigger off balance. This is especially nice for fights with burst phases or for shorter fights, but over the course of a long fight with no separated phases, it will come out to a little over 3% total damage boost with off balance on cooldown. So probably will end up situational depending on class and the specific encounter, but definitely going to come into play on some fights for sure. The next new CP node I ran across is called Force of Nature. This one increases your offensive penetration by 900 for every status effect your target has. I believe there are 8 status effects total, so that would be up to 7200 extra pen if all of them are applied. That likely won't be the case very often, but there are a lot of status effects that should be up all the time and this could really help solve a lot of the penetration worries, especially if you're wearing all medium armor. You do give up a champion point node to slot this though, so definitely something to consider as well. It isn't just free penetration, you do have to take a hit somewhere else for it. Definitely an interesting route they chose to introduce more penetration into champion points though. We'll see what the numbers end up at if they change at all before this goes live. I also stumbled across several nerfs and buffs across some of the existing champion point nodes. I won't get into those now as I don't want to read too much into something that may not even exist when the PTS hits live, but there are some adjustments that we'll look into once that happens. 
I did also play the new Tales of Tribute card game. I won't really be talking much about it here. I was pretty tired when I tried it out and I'll be honest, I didn't really understand what was going on. I'm probably the worst person to come to for info on that part of the preview. I'm sure some others out there who are more proficient at card games and spent more time on this will have a lot better info. Not gonna lie, I was pretty lost though. I'll definitely try to give it another shot when the PTS rolls around. And then finally, I did run into some minor balance changes, but I didn't see anything really with the class balance. This could just be because it's an old build, so maybe some stuff will be coming by the time it hits the PTS. But I won't go through the changes I did see, but I promise there was nothing too crazy there, and I don't want to speculate over info that's not finalized yet. Though I will point out that the weapon and spell damage glyphs were not combined, and consumables that give the major buffs were also not combined. So these were some changes I was hoping might be coming, and I specifically looked into to see if they were there. Who knows though, maybe they are coming and they just weren't added into this build that we got to take a look at. I'm not sure, but we should find out pretty soon. I'm sure we'll still have a lot of surprises when the PTS comes around and I'll make sure to do my normal thorough patch note review over on my Twitch channel when the notes go live and then I'll break those down for videos here on YouTube. But that pretty much wraps up what I gathered from the preview server. Really cool experience to be able to dive in early, even if a lot of it was unfinished. As someone who really looks forward to all the new info that comes with each PTS cycle, this was a real treat for me to get to sneak in early. I want to give a big thanks to my current Patreon supporters and YouTube members. There are ways to help support the channel and keep these guides coming for as little as $3. And a special thanks to Nicholas, Simon, Cougar is Bay in the Cougar City Guild, the Order of War Guild, Iffy, Cantankerous Cat, Shady, Blakewin816, Mordecai1212, Santanico, and my wonderful wife. Thanks again for stopping by. I'll see y'all in the next one. Uh, bye.